Constitution, which is actually uh, more a, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to hear from one of the great philosophers in this country. Uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, many years ago, uh, actually in 1966, uh, I had uh, actually left Oklahoma in 1965 to go to school at Pepperdine. And then after getting a master's degree at Pepperdine, I uh, entered uh, UCLA in 1966. And um, it was there where I first heard the name uh, Maulana Karenga. In fact, uh, one of the most significant things was that uh, I had become a member of an organization at UCLA called Harambe. And then uh, eventually I was elected to the, be the chairperson for the uh, SNCC chapter at UCLA. But uh, I also heard uh, some of the tapes. Back in those days, we used to share tapes of, of, of Maulana Karenga actually at the time uh, saying something that really has uh, guided a lot of my thinking uh, throughout my life. And that is that the fundamental crisis in the African community was a cultural crisis. And it has sort of uh, colored everything that I do. So I, I'm very happy today. Uh, I'm Malefi Asante, uh, but I want to introduce you, those of you who may not know, to Dr. Maulana Karenga, who is professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies at California State University, Long Beach. He is the creator of the Pan-African cultural holiday Kwanzaa and the Nguzo Saba, the Seven Principles, and author of the authoritative text titled Kwanzaa, a celebration of family, community, and culture. An activist scholar, he is chair of the organization US and the National Association of Kawaito Organizations and executive director of the African American Cultural Center and the Kawaita Institute of Pan African Studies, and also co chair of the Black Community Clergy and Labor Alliance, the BCCLA. Dr. Karenga is also the author of numerous scholarly articles and books, including Essays on Struggle, Position, and Analysis. Kawaita and Questions of Life and Struggle. Ma'at, the Moral Ideal in Ancient Egypt, a study in classical African ethics. Introduction to Black Studies, the fourth edition. Odu Ifa, the Ethical Teachings, and many others. He is currently writing a major work on the social and ethical philosophy of Malcolm X entitled the Liberation Ethics of Malcolm X, Critical Consciousness, Moral Grounding, and Transformative Struggle. Dr. Karenga is the recipient of numerous awards for scholarship, leadership, and service, including the Paul Robeson Zora Neale Hurston Award for scholarly work significantly contributed to the understanding, development, and appreciation of African World Culture and the CLR James Award for outstanding publication of scholarly works that advance the discipline of African and Black Studies, both from the National Council for Black Studies. He is also the subject of the book by Dr. Malefic Kete Asante entitled Maulana Karenga, An Intellectual Portrait. There's many, many more things that one could say about Dr. Maulana Karenga. Uh, I always tell people uh, that uh, he's one of the uh, only people I know. Uh, I think I know one other person with two doctorates. And uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about uh, uh, all kinds of things today. I, I used to wonder what it would have been like to have had a conversation or to have seen a conversation between Carter G. Woodson and W.B. Du Bois or 
had an interview uh, between Richard Wright, for example, and Ralph Ellison, or uh, Octavia Butler uh, talking to Toni Morrison, uh, or any of our people who had written or who had ideas if they had uh, spoken together, uh, how wonderful this would be. And I think that obviously um, uh, we have uh, over 90 people who are already on this uh, Zoom, and I'm sure there would be more, many more than the 90 who are already here, uh, to hear a, a conversation by one of the, uh, actually a, a talk and discussion by one of the great intellectuals of not just our time, but of all the time uh, that we African people have been in the United States uh, or United Snakes, as somebody said, of America. But, uh, but it, it, it's wonderful. And I just want to greet uh, my brother, my good friend, uh, actually my colleague in struggle, uh, Dr. Maulana Karenga. Just want to greet you, sir. You may be uh, muted. I want to say Asante Sana Mole, Asante for the invitation, Asante for the opportunity to talk with you. I'm always enriched and my mind is always expanded when I engage you and talk to you. So thank you for being a friend and colleague. Thank you for being um, a fellow combatant in the struggle to free ourselves and be ourselves as African people in the world. Uh, Asante Sana Maulana. Maulana, what, what prompted you uh, in terms of your consciousness, how did you as a, you know, I'm from Georgia and you're from Maryland. You were born in Maryland, I understand. Eastern Shore, I've been there many times. And, and I know that place. What prompted your consciousness? What, what, what do you attribute that to? Hey, well, appreciate what you said if I say correctly. I, I would say first of all, my background, and, and, uh, and I'm just too this instructor to put an outline so I can speak from it. But that's all right. my background, uh, the conditions of our people at the time, my study, and then my involvement in the movement, and finally my will to uh, struggle and to go beyond where I was. So let's start with where I came from. I came from, like you, a segregated uh, situation, right? But I came from a Black community and a Black family that put a lot of emphasis on what they call doing good for the race, mm -hmm. they like race conscious. Gotcha. And they said, there's two things you always have to do. Gotcha. Honor your family and honor the race. Do things <laughs> for your family. Do things <laughs> for your family. So that, that was it. And, and then also I had a lot of support from my mother, my father. Uh, my father was a minister. He was he had gone to the seminary. He was very meticulous. I mean, Sometimes I look in the mirror and I, I think about um, <laughs> what I say and how certified, that's how he was. But my mother was gentle and she was always, you know, wanting us to <clears throat> think first about values and think first about relationship. Is it good for us in terms of our relationship with others? And so I kind of came from that background of, and people, also I came from a background where I was the 14th child, the seventh son of 14 child, last child. So all my sisters and brothers this year, uh, had gone, uh, uh, the brothers had gone from the house and I had sisters left and I was working. And so I followed them and they, they were very intelligent and so they challenged me. And also they left a, uh, a footprint in, in school where the teacher would always say, now your sister. <laughs> you know, they, uh, so I, had a challenge. I, I know, know that so I had no vibe. I had no sibling rivalry, nothing like that. I was like, and I think it's up my Latin teacher, which is a hard line. She'll say, That sentence, when well, you translate that, don't make sense, and you do it. <laughs> and your sister was ready. Why didn't you get the. <laughs> Sometimes in my class, I was ahead of my class um, mate, and uh, I wouldn't take my book home. I just, you know, I was there. But then that made me be less achieving than I should have been. So that's right. it was a good corrective for me. That's right. Those kind of people, my teachers, my family, and then older people, because I was um, came up young uh, and in the midst of older people, I never played sports or anything like that. I was never interested. I just read. Sometimes I would travel with my mother to just meet 
to, to, to sit and talk with older people. And sometimes they would just sit for hours just to be with each other. They would, they would say and say, and if you That's talk good. to them, it looked like you, what, you can't discipline yourself. Some, not in a negative way, but there was a discipline about thinking, going inward and thinking about life. And when I, when I grew up, most of the time, older people would come and talk to me. I mean, they just start talking to me. <laughs> and I would respond, they would keep talking to me. Yeah. So I, I grew old quickly. <laughs> I, and I was never at home with people of my own age. I didn't dislike them or anything. I just didn't have, I didn't. It's like one of my friends told me about <laughs> why people like the gossip room. He said, you don't come around enough to kick it around. You know, you, 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 need, you need to meet with us more often. <laughs> but I didn't have anything to say because I don't want to talk locker room. I don't want to talk. I don't do sports. I don't, so what would I talk about? <laughs> and, and they would be they would be sometimes turned off by that. They don't want to do it for so long. Right. Yeah. You know, they want to do superficial things, and so I want to talk deep. And so wow. I learned to live uh, inside myself. I learned to cultivate a life of the mind. So a lot of times I lived wow. inside my mind with reading and teaching, being alone, right, and being uh, mainly with older people. All, all, well, you, well, well, my Lana, I started. Well, my Lana, that that I is. I got to the second part. <laughs> well, you can go ahead. Do it. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> because this is great. I mean, you know, you you know, you know, to be to be honest with you, I just this little intervention. You, you brought tears to my eyes as you were talking, particularly about your family and about how you grew up in, in the family and being the, the youngest of 14. I was number four and 16. So mm -hmm. I, I understand big families and, and all of that, but it's yeah. really wonderful to hear you talk. So talk about the second part. And, For, and also because we shared, we shared a lot. And when we shared a lot, when we shared a lot, uh, I was I was prepared for for opportunity to uh, communicating uh, conversation. I, I was I was um, I, I was a uh, whole woman. I, I, I messed up. Uh, oh, I guess. So I I was more uh, ready for cooperation because that's what we had to share. And so mm -hmm. In the South, as you know. Everybody was a potential relative. That's right. So sure. it wasn't a question of being a good neighbor. It was being a, <laughs> a, a good Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you are muted. Uh, Professor Karenga, I think you are muted. The, the, the host muted me by mistake. <laughs> OK, all right. Thank you. OK. OK. So anyhow, yeah, because I, I didn't know. So you were talking was, about relatives and. Uh, yeah, and I was saying, aside from that, Mona, I was saying that we had to be good relatives. So mm -hmm. they would come, they would share our room, they would share our, uh, share our food, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever we had, even though we didn't have much, mm -hmm. we, we had to share it. But it wasn't like, at first we, we had to get used to that, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, okay, all right, right. We had to be taught that this is important to us. This is a black value, right? They, didn't, right. they didn't talk like we talk Afrocentric. That's right. right. You know, with, with the category you gave us, like Afrocentric, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we just said this, this is the right thing to do. And mm -hmm. usually it was from a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so it wasn't like they, they were black, but they were black Christians, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was with the black community, mm -hmm. but it was a black community informed by the best of what it meant to be a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we had to share. And we, 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 we learned that. So when I finally got into African culture, and that was one of the fundamental ways of being human in the world, is sharing. It was not a difficult thing for me. This, right. this is how right. we do, yeah. right? And, and, this, and like when I heard people say, I need some time by myself. I, I want to be alone. I need my own. I, 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 I want to be with people because I grew up, right. with, you know, with, with, with people. And then also the conditions of life. I came up, uh, when I came into consciousness, I was in the movement. I was in the midst of the black movement, the civil rights movement. Uh, I did. I came from the South in the but I came here to California to 
get my education. And uh, also I went to York Pennsylvania, finished high school. And then I came out here. I wanted to go to UCLA, but I didn't have the money. So I went to a city college. That was a beautiful experience for me, uh, both intellectually and practically. I joined a lot of the movements. I was in, of course, again, the civil rights movement, demonstrating, raising money for them, the peace movement, the anti-capital punishment movement. I got involved in all of that. I became the first black um, the vice president and president of, of City College. And I won by organizing people of color, right? I, did, mm-hmm. I, I identified with what we called then the third world, right? <laughs> so people, the international students, people didn't, didn't even see them as a voting block. That's I was right. interested in the world. That's I had a world consciousness thing. Yeah. You know? okay. So when I met Malcolm, and Malcolm real Well, that's Curtis, what I, yeah, I wanted to ask you about Malcolm. Go right ahead. And tell us important, right? Because uh, then I did study, right? I became alienated from Europe in the study. And I asked myself, like Garvey, I came into Garvey through Nkrumah. I was very impressed with the rising African nation. I'm going to be quick on this, because this is a long story. That's I'm all sure. right. I'm like, the average gentleman is long now. <laughs> Let me see if I can make it shorter. So, so here's what happened. So I'm in college, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm an intellectual, and I'm asking, where is the African text? Mm-hmm. So I had first became alienated from European texts in high school, and I read Asian texts. So I got grounded in Asian texts before I knew African. Then I found African text. Mm-hmm. Then I started doing African texts, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, my study led me to where I am, and then in my practice, and then my will to be free. Mm-hmm. By encounters with Malcolm, both intellectually and, and, and personally, were very uh, decisive in my coming into consciousness. As you know, I always give the nation credit, uh, both to Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm, but especially Malcolm, because I knew him and certainly <clears throat> identified with him in a very important way. Uh, so we brought Malcolm uh, out to uh, Minister Malcolm X, uh, Malik Shabazz, uh, Al Haj Malik Shabazz, I'm sorry, Al Haj Malik Shabazz, we brought him uh, to uh, UCLA. And afterwards, he, we went up and talked to him. He invited me to come to the mosque. And then after that, he invited me to come to the restaurant because we had this long conversation. And so we talked all past night. That's when the buses ran. She said, How are you going to get home? I said, Well, you have to wait. The bus come. He said, No, I'm driving. He wow. drove him. By himself, he didn't have a bodyguard. He didn't. He didn't have a bodyguard. He drove me. We talked all the way, wow, and then that... I kept in contact with him. And uh, I wrote him, and I was surprised when I was doing this book that he had kept my letter. I found it at the Chamber. Wow, that yeah. Ma- Malana, did you did you find him? Did you find him um, uh, open? I mean, he, he talked with you. Did you find, first of all, in terms of how he received? you was he was he uh, uh, what type of personality did, did he uh, convey uh, to you first of all he was one of the greatest minds of the 20th century that, that just you know, a short organic intellect very well read widely read sharp yeah. analytical uh, one of the great social critics of our time right wow that's the first thing I know I mean because I'm an intellectual I'm yeah. a bad, right but he was also a sensitive brother, just like how he wanted to know how I was, I was going to get home. If he, you know, a lot of people that are big time, they don't That's get right. in masses except to form crowds, right? That's I'm, right. I'm That's right. So, and so uh, he he wanted to take me home. He was truthful. That's he was clear. not addicted to vices either, right? When yeah. he when he talked, he lived. When he said wake up, he meant a lot about cultivating a life of the mind, coming wow. into critical consciousness. Right. When he said clean up, more grounded, speak mm. do mm. justice, be kind, do not do evil, as the old people said, mm. he meant it. He believed. That's, that's how he lived his life. Oh. And when he said stand up, so wake up, clean up, and stand up, right? When he mm. said stand up, be courageous, right? Mm. Don't let the white man frighten you, right? That one of the most difficult things for the politics of liberation is fear of the oppressor. But That's we must right. not fear the oppressor in right. any sense. And we must daily confront him and society radically, relentlessly, and repeat. 
It's well, so important for us. And yeah. one of the things he said, and then I'll stop. And then, That's right. One of the things he said you know, in his teachings, he said, the battlefront, the battle, <clears throat> wherever black people are, is a battle line. Mm -hmm. That whether we're in the east or the west, the north or the south, you and I are living in a country that is a battle line for us, all of us. And so I took that seriously. I mean, I mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. see myself as not simply an activist intellectual, but a soldier. I see mm -hmm. myself as a combatant for liberation. Mm -hmm. And I have not given that up for 55 years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anniversary yeah. of our yeah. nation. And as a Christian say, I no way to stop. Well, that's a good point. I know, I, and I know that you won't give it up, but I, I got a question for you. This is a question regarding religion. So yeah. you, much like myself, uh, I came out of a Christian uh, background uh, uh -huh. in the sense that my grandfather was, was a preacher. Uh, well, yeah. he was a, a, a jack leg preacher. He was not really, he didn't have a congregation, so to speak, but he, he traveled from place to place. <laughs> And he would take me with him, right? So, so the question for me, for you, uh, is then uh, that path, that uh, the, the possibility was there for you to go into the Christian ministry. But for some reason, you didn't take that route. And, and can you just sort of say something on that? Yeah, well, first of all, in honor of my father, but also in honor of Kyle Eden. Kabila says that what Malcolm said is right. The logic of the oppressed cannot be the logic of the oppressed if they want liberation. And I said, if you have a logic of liberation, you require a language of liberation. And the first aspect of that language of liberation is dignity from me, <clears throat> categories of life. <clears throat> and so I would see your, your father not as a Jack Lane preacher, but as an itinerant preacher, one that traveled around. And my father had four churches, and he was itinerant. He would go around. When he gave it up, he still preached. So he was an itinerant He wanted to become a farmer. For some reason, he just gave up being a preacher. He and my mother loved the land. They loved farming. They wanted to farm. And then we would walk in the fields and in the woods, and they talked to me about God's creation, how beautiful it was, how productive it was. But as you must have guessed, and it was a good question, Mother, I never, I used to preach when I was small. I would preach to the family members and things, mm -hmm. you know, because it was there. And I loved reading the Bible, memorizing Bible verses for my mother. It would just lift her up. You know what I mean? <laughs> my father thought I should do it. You know, he was that kind of guy. You know, he said, you had to go beyond <clears throat> the ordinary. If you don't do beyond the ordinary, hey, you, it's like, what's, what's going on? You must strive for excellence. Well, my mother and father believed that, but my father was more insistent on it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and hard line. So one of the things I did was I used to like to speak so i learned to speak lecturing on the bible lecturing on current events as well as we knew them at that time because i used to read the paper for my mother she always wanted to read current events and so i would read it you know for mm -hmm. her to come in I, I would sit on the floor and then i just read for her. and that that was the uplifting i would read the bible and, and sometimes i just stop reading it and quote I'm just a That's good. <laughs> no, no, well, you know, well, you know. Even when I came out here, beloved, I still send her Bible verses. Even after I had given up the letter, I still send my mother. Well, I, 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 I just made this last point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why don't, why did you become a preacher? I did not see myself as a religious person. Mm. And I concentrated not on theology. I had some issues with the way people put uh, the Christian God in a kind of angry kind of, I'm going to kill you if you don't do what I do. <laughs> and after yeah. a while, when I was when I became a, uh, uh, an adult or a, you know, after a young person in college, I started questioning that. I mean, why would somebody want me to do that and burn me? I just up, but burn me forever. 
Uh, there was a lot of things that I read. Even the Muslims. I met, I met the Muslims, right? Yes. I, met, I read Bertrand Russell. I read all the people that criticized the kind of roughness uh, to this religion. And so I didn't want to do I wanted to be what I am, an intellectual, an activist, scholar. I wanted to be what I saw my teachers be, what they taught me about. And, and I only remember this later. <laughs> since I didn't teach as much about the women, like Mary mm -hmm. and we were taught about her. This one was just massive. But I, I went for the male thing. You know, we went to sexism at that time. That's right. You know, That's the right. man got to roll. The That's black right. man got to be controlled. Mm -hmm. The white man trying to kill us, etc. Which he's still doing, by the way. But anyhow, <laughs> we learned that there is no separate uh, freedom. That freedom is indivisible, right? That's right. But now we can draw on Mary McClapton. We knew about Harry Tubman before, but mm -hmm. now we see her in a whole different kind of mm -hmm. light. So yes, I thought my my best way was to be an activist scholar. I love intellectual uh, intellectual study and intellectual sharing. I like like to acquire knowledge and to share it. So so Dr. Kar Dr. Karenga, let me ask you a question or Malana. Let me ask you a question about how cow how Kawa Ida emerged for you? Uh, did the organization us uh, start first, or did Kawa Ida start first? How, how how did that come about? Because a lot of people don't realize that there is a they don't understand the philosophy behind it. They they know the word Kawa Ida, but could you just explain that a little bit for us? I developed Kawa Ida. Kawa Ida is my philosophy. Uh, and I define it as an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. And mm -hmm. it's out of Kawaita that I created us, that I created uh, Kwanzaa, that mm -hmm. I developed the Nguzo Saba, mm -hmm. right? And I wanted to study African culture. I got involved in this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I asked myself, what is the social cement and you that holds these cultures together, these cultures and societies together, and give them their humanistic character. And I believe it was their community and ethical values, right? That there was a essence, the ethics of sharing there that was key to life, to meaningfulness, uh, and to grounding and orienting ourselves and directing our lives toward good and expansive ends. And so that's how I started out. And I started doing this in junior college, it's community college now. We used to call it junior college. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to UCLA, I, I got it. So when the movement intensified, right, mm -hmm. I left UCLA. Mm -hmm. I was I was glad you stayed because you know <laughs> <laughs> Well well but you ended but you ended up getting two PhDs. I only got one. So 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 what happens is that I, I began to ask myself uh, the question that uh, Batum asked her, Dr. Batum. She said, knowledge is the prime need of the hour, but people want to know how you're going to use this knowledge. Yeah. And she said, we, must, we who have knowledge must discover the dawn and then share it with the masses of our people. Yeah. Most, right? And that was a reminder of what my mother and father taught, what my teachers taught, right? I went back to Sunbury. They gave me a welcome. The city gave me a welcome. Some of my older teachers came back. It was just beautiful to see them and see them proud of being proud of their student. You know what I mean? That, it was just beautiful to see that and how black people just enjoy the fruit of their labor. And I was glad I could bring them something of, of value. So I took this um, philosophy and I studied and drew from first ancient texts. Then, because first I studied, this might be You mean ancient, ancient African texts or just or any ancient texts? Ancient African texts. Okay. okay. Ancient African. So I told you I had studied Asian texts first because mm -hmm. I didn't know there was African. But guess why I found, Malibu and, 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 and brothers and sisters, guess why I found the most important knowledge I would get? It was from the anthropologists that sat. African culture. Mm. What I looked for is what they condemned. Mm. Mm. That's what I want. I don't want to do what they praise because I know what yeah. they want 
do, they want to separate us from the originality, the beauty, the depthfulness. And right. that's when I made up my mind and yeah. I've taught it ever since. Africa is my moral idea. Other yeah. people might refer to Africa. They use it as a reference. I use it as a resource. Mm -hmm. I say that there is no people more holy, more sacred than yeah. our own. No that's history right. more sacred. There is no, if we don't have saints, there are no saints. If we don't have prophets, there are no prophets, right? right? So I'm reading my own text, and I don't. Yeah. And, and James Cone built from this, you know, when he did Black Liberation. Yes, yeah, yes. I yeah. said that this that that black is our ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. I start from that position. When I say mm -hmm. black, I mean color, culture, and self conscious practice, mm -hmm. or color, culture, and conscious. Mm -hmm. conscious always lead to what uh, awareness, commitment, and practice. Mm -hmm. When we say you're conscious, that means you're also active. You have that, that active self-knowledge is right. what we're talking about mm -hmm. here. So mm -hmm. I use that to begin to struggle in this country. And mm -hmm. I needed a structure. I believed in organization. I read the liberation of people, both of Africa and Asia. Right? Mm -hmm. I read both of them. And all the liberation movements needed a structure, a party, but an organization. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I created an organization. Mm -hmm. And people are lying when they said Jamal founded this verse for me and I got in it later. Mm -hmm. Please. Where's mm -hmm. the evidence of that? People always want to <laughs> take right. away from me what I did. You ever they do. Right. Give me credit for Kwanzaa. They leave it out. They leave out me. You're doing the seven principles. They leave out me in the ASCAC history, which I call the initiating meeting. Our organization has already laid this out when we finally put it together and invited J.P. Rutherford, Dr. Ben, Dr. 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 Right. J.P. Rutherford, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, uh, Ricketti, our men, Wade, Dr. Wade Novus, all these people. We brought them from 75 cities. Our organization, us, did that. Nobody did that before we did that. We That's did right. that. So I, I, know, I, I know that as a fact. So yes, I, I know think that. we need to say this because I'm going to go yeah. back to my organization, us, because I would not have been able to do Kwanzaa or to develop my philosophy, or to develop this uh, in Guzo Saba without the intellectual and material support my organization, us, gave me, right? Mm. That's so important for me mm -hmm. to give the advocates, we call ourselves advocates, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. because we're active. Mm -hmm. That's we're right. actively uh, advocating for Black people, not mm -hmm. only intellectually, uh, but also in, in, in practical ways. So that's how I created uh, my philosophy. Mm -hmm. My philosophy was born in the fire and furnace of the ideological and practical struggle of the 60s, arguing with Marxists, arguing with Panthers, mm -hmm. arguing with, uh, with, mm -hmm. with, with even I'm, I belong to the Republic of New Africa, we used mm -hmm. to argue about where are we going to go with this, how are we mm -hmm. going, but it was not an antagonist, mm -hmm. antagonistic thing mm -hmm. until, uh, you know, the Iron Hand well, got involved. In well, well, I wanted I wanted to ask you about I, I wanted to ask you about this uh, the the concepts that grew out of that uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know that whole movement with the uh, COINTEL and all that uh, because there were people who were talking about a separation between what they call revolutionary nationalism and cultural nationalism. Can you explain to the audience, you got over 130 people now listening to this, on, and we just want to know, explain to us that, that situation. Neither I nor Malcolm made that such distinction, right? Mm -hmm. Malcolm said anybody oppressed and with any conscience at all had to be revolutionary. We started out, if you read our first public document to the country and to the world, the Potable Karenga, you would see in there that we self-define as revolutionary nationalists. But we are nationalists first. Since the European the segments of the left, they introduced that doctrine, the Panthers picked it up, and they pushed it. But let me tell you what culture nationalism is, right? So you can see that it's as revolutionary as anybody else. And nobody, nobody, including the Panthers, were on more FBI and COINTEL program list than us. If you find them on a list, you'll find us on the list. And ours lasted long. Ours went all the way back 1975. I haven't seen the list lately, but I'm sure 
the same thing. Now, let's go to what cultural nationalism. Cultural nationalism is rooted in three fundamental principles. The first is that the defining feature of any people or culture or nation is its pardon me, the defining feature of any people or nation is its culture. That's the first thing. We're defined by our culture. It's our fundamental way of being human in the world. That's first. Second, that for people to be itself and free itself, it must be self-conscious, self-determining, and again, rooted in its own culture. And third, that the quality of life of a people and the success of its liberation struggle depends upon it waging cultural revolution within and political That's revolution right. without, That's resulting right. in a radical transformation of self, society, and ultimately the world. That's right. That's what we came in. That's mm -hmm. what we started. Mm -hmm. And if you read our work, you know that so. Mm -hmm. It's our enemies and our and our antagonists that decided to draw that artificial line. Now let me show you how that's not even good thinking. That's sloppy mm -hmm. theory. Let me show you why. And I wrote this in my dissertation. My first dissertation was on Africa. Afro-American nationalism, right? And so I say, when you talk about revolutionary and culture as opposites, that's sloppy thinking. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary, mm -hmm. radical, progressive, reactionary, conservative, those represent qualities of social motion and practice. That's mm -hmm. what we say people are in, according to how they think and practice, right? Mm -hmm. But to say, uh, uh, culture, religion, politics, economic, that are, that's the social, that are the social areas of emphasis. So mm -hmm. some people like the nation, they stress religious nationalism. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of the core people in the later days stress economic nationalism, right? Uh, the Republic of New Africa stress political nationalism. We, those, these are areas of emphasis. We stress culture. But now here's the key. What do we mean by culture? And it's in the book. Nobody had any right being confused about what we thought about culture. No one thought, really, we believed that we could just dance our way to free. Mm -hmm. Or that putting on a boo-boo would free us. <laughs> All that is a lie. And I think, just like a beret on what people used to do is condemn us Now they're claiming they were always conscious of Africa. <laughs> but I told them, look, don't you ask me why I'm wearing a Uber and African clothes. You got a French beret on, you got uh, Italian leather shoes and London leather, and you, you asking me about Africa? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> about I, li I like that answer. Yeah, I, I, let's be honest, right? And this is actually in my in my in the photo. I'm I'm telling people this. You see, so you think and the white people when they praising this group, they chose this group because Elder Cleaver brought white people back into the movement, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the white people told me when I was a visiting professor at Stanford, and we had a meeting of radicals re reassess uh, assessing mm -hmm. what happened in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, wh wh why are y'all so hard on it? Because mm -hmm. he said, we we are as part of the group that said white people need to get out of our organization and build their own. <laughs> we said that white people should, right, stop believing they could take us to lunch in bed and solve the problem, right? That they need to go back home where their mothers and fathers were, because those were the races that were controlling our lives and theirs. And we told them some other things I don't want to say. But <laughs> I just think it's very important yeah, for you to yeah. understand that. Yeah. If you look at that. All of us argued that. Mm. Carmen Ture, the same thing. Look what happened to Carmen Ture. Carmen Ture wasn't really a panther. They just claimed him. They put him on. But he broke and he did the same criticism I did. First of all, you can't character assassinate me because I don't want to relate closely with white people, right? Mm -hmm. I can see them as uh, coalition partners for a particular issue, but long term alliance, they have to prove that we, we got a healthy suspicion that's about right. people that belong to the special group, right? 
It doesn't mean I hate them. I work with people every day on my campus, right? I don't say look at the look at them like this and funny. No, I let people prove themselves. That's right. At the same time, I don't ever find myself dependent on them because you're no longer independent. You're sad like whether you admit it or not. You That's have to right. count on them for everything. And you need to attack everybody that doesn't believe what they say you should believe. You got a problem. That's, That's our right. position. One last thing. <clears throat> no one else had the military capacity, para paramilitary capacity that we had. That's just a fact. People can say what they want. People might do what we call custer stands and do street theater with pieces, but everybody know we had. And everybody mm -hmm. know we were the most disciplined, most ideologically and effective paramilitary group in the country. And the only people who had a greater capacity for that kind of activity but didn't train militarily with pieces, with guns or weapons, was the Muslims. Y'all know that. They did mm -hmm. mainly Yanguni, oh. uh, karate. They mm -hmm. did martial arts. We did martial arts, but we also did weaponry, right? So, and the FBI put us on the list for these things and wrote about us training. But we always said, we don't, we don't concede anything that the white man said. If he says it's two o'clock, we said, no, let me look at my wife. Just to keep in the habit of denying the president any right to tell us anything. <laughs> this is who I am, y'all. Okay. You know right. This okay. is who I am, no matter what else. Well, I said, this is who I'm. I'm against my oppressor. I don't give him any quarter. That's right. I don't need to ask him, certainly not how to live. That's right. How to marry, how to uh, grow up, how to train my children, how to teach people. I don't need to ask him. I don't ask, I need to ask him who God is. I That's don't need right. to ask him about ethics. <laughs> That's right. We're the ones who stood up first and spoke absolutely first, two absolutely. and two and taught the world what was good and beautiful and introduced some of the basic discipline of human knowledge in the Nile Valley. Well, well I want to ask you. I want to ask you. Come in here, no junior brother. <laughs> We're the elders of humanity. Okay, that's right. Absolutely, Maulana. Let, let me ask you uh, right. because you you no no you 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 rolling and it's good. I like this. All right. So, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that about folks and that. <laughs> yeah, right. But all the things that lasted from the 60s that continue today, they had a culture nationalist root. You tell me something they did. Well, well, that is the truth. I mean, and, that's, and, and I think well, most people that's, realize that's, that. Okay, I'm going no, no. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, people realize that, uh, you know, so when you look. You realize that Black Studies <laughs> is a culture nationalist project. Absol you absolutely. Like, like the Panthers, George Mason, yeah. and the Panthers speak with Philip yeah. Connor, said, F Black Studies, we need absolutely. to Absolutely. Absolutely. Do they realize that? No, you know, what people don't. Race but before right. they thought we put too much emphasis on ourselves. Yes. Yeah, black black studies, but not just black, and you're right, not just black studies, almost all cultural forms. Whether yeah. you talk about people starting schools and naming them Imani, whether yeah. they, you know, whatever they want to name their school, Harambe, whatever you want to call yourself, all of this near purpose, you see all this in the institutions. These are cultural institutions. And that's why we, I really wanted to uh, talk with you and interview you on this because fundamentally, uh, when we start talking about uh, these subjects, one of the things that appear, that, that really is clear to me is that in terms of all the um, philosophers, and I've said this before, that all the philosophers, if you look at those uh, uh, brothers and sisters who are trained uh, in what they call European philosophy, uh, th there are very few, I mean, almost none that really would have an impact on the African-American community as great or comprehensive as the impact that you have had on the African community uh, by virtue of your own uh, philosophy and your own work. I mean, uh, when you start looking around for institutions, uh, for, for ideals, um, you discover that uh, certainly uh, out of Organization Us and Kawaita that we see these things still in existence. Now let me uh, ask you, and we, we're getting down to 
a, a fundamental part of this. We're going to talk about Kwanzaa in a minute. But let me, let me ask you about uh, your reliance on African cultural foundations like Kemet, uh, the Zulu, and the Yoruba for sort of ancestral foundations. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, appreciate what you said, Francis, but I really want to um, stress again, and thanks for asking that, Keep in mind that I argue that Africa is our moral idea. That is to say that whenever we think of what is good and beautiful and right, we first consult Africa. We're going to solve an issue. We're going to address the issue. We consult Africa first, right? And so I started out, as I said, and one of my teachers, I, I don't know if you, got, you took a class with him, Counselor Taylor. No, but I know Counselor, I knew Counselor Taylor, yeah. He taught, he taught African anthropology. I just liked how he taught art, European anthropology, taught, taught about his own discipline and showed the Eurocentric basis of it, right? But at the same time, he introduced us to text and to different ways of thinking about Africa. And that I added to my analysis as mm -hmm. a Kawita philosopher. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the things, even before I met him, I decided that I was going to choose an African language. Because mm -hmm. I believe that the culture is often contained and expressed best in the language itself. And that even though there are translations, it's so important for us to translate. And mm -hmm. that's why whenever I write something, I try to learn. So I first started with Zulu. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I started with Swahili because Swahili is non-ethnic. That is non-tribal in, in a narrow way. Doesn't mean there are some people associated, but it is the most widely spread African language in Africa, right? Spoken in 14 countries, right? People used to say, oh, that has, that's Arabic. It's not Arabic. That's people who don't know linguistics. Right? <laughs> that's right. right? It's yeah. just like calling calling English German. Because right. German right. Root, you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, got some, we, we got we got some Arabic the right yeah. word, but we got some yeah. Hindi the right word. Yeah. We got some Hindi <laughs> the right. right word, right? Because we are world historical people, and we come yeah. in contact with other people, right? And so we we can we can take those words and use them, but the the core of who we are doesn't change. Our syntax, our deep structure is African, right? And so that's the same with, with Swahili. And if mm. you study Zulu and other Bantu languages, you know that, right? That's right. So anyhow, I, I took Swahili. And, 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 and I just want, you know, I would just intervene right here and say that because people may not know this, that uh, 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 Dr. Karenga received a honorary doctorate from uh, the University of KwaZulu in Natal, University of Natal, which is uh, the top Zulu uh, university probably in uh, South Africa. Uh, and that's because of his scholarship and his relationship to, to the Zulu culture and, and, and language. Yeah, I'm, I just wanted the people to know that, uh, Dr. Karim. Go right ahead, Malana. So I, once I did Swahili and I, and I mastered it, because I did independent study. So not, well, you know, I did independent study, so, and then when I went to UCLA, I found out I could get some money because the U.S. and for, for, for a, a fellowship to continue my study, uh, because the U.S. saw Swahili as a critical language. That's right. So I continued my That's study. Right. And right. I, UCLA was just a world for me because That's Africans from all over the continent That's came right. to UCLA. And so okay. I could practice my language. I could practice French. <laughs> I, I started learning French before I left uh, Maryland. Yeah. We, we didn't have nothing. I don't know about your school. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, but we didn't have anything but Latin. <laughs> that's right. Because the last year before I left, yeah. then we got a nice French teaching. Yeah. Uh, the basics of French, and I kept studying it after I left. So we could talk French, we could talk uh, Swahili, and then Zulu. So what happened is, I chose Zulu as my next culture because it was military, just to be honest with you. Yeah, right? I, because we were training young people, these soldiers for the struggle. Mm -hmm. We believed in national liberation, and we still mm -hmm. do, right? And so the Zulu discipline was impressive. That's right. And then I also built on their creation narrative. 
creation narrative of Unkulu Nkulu, right? Mm -hmm. And um, coming into the world, the ultimate ancestor, right? So we, we had taken God out of the sky and brought him down to our houses, right? <laughs> and we say, God, you know, the divine must be in us and the divine must be in our houses and our community. Otherwise, what use is it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we took a hard line and sometimes we were, you know, uh, overly harsh. But, in, you know, if somebody asks me now, I say, okay, here's how I would phrase it. <laughs> it's the same point is that we can't look up in the sky and let go unattended the suffering, the oppression, the struggles that people have in this world. That's right. That's we right. cannot live inside cannot ourselves to be it. moral persons. To only be moral in relationship. That's another fundamental African teaching, right? So right. when the Zulu say uh Ningu Muntu Ingabantu, I'm a person to other people. Mm -hmm. That means what what we used to always say, uh, that in Peter said, I am because we are and because we are, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can't be a person by myself. I'm a person to other people, right? Here's right. I put it in the pure, because a lot of times that's happened to Swahili and uh, Zulu, is that they use Nki instead of C for Zulu, mm -hmm. and they use um, Ni instead of Tu for mm -hmm. uh, Swahili. Mm -hmm. And I, I always use the collective. So I, I, I won't say in Zulu, uh, uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I would say Ningani. Mm -hmm. uh, to the collective. Nina. I would say, how are y'all? Even mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. the person. That's right. And so right. it's same in Swahili. Mm -hmm. When you say home, you can say Kwangu mm -hmm. in my place. But even if you live alone, the way I learned Swahili, the way I learned the culture, you're supposed to say Kwaitu. Because mm -hmm. even if you're there physically by yourself, your ancestors and your family are there with you. That's right. So that keeps you in mind that you're in relationship, that you have an obligation to relate rightfully, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I studied and I put in and how we eat it. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that defined us different than the average mm, revolutionary that uh, is born from outside of the mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. is that they don't put em enough emphasis on self-transformation, right? Mm -hmm. And Malcolm did, and I do, mm -hmm. and our people do, that is to say, People talk about changing social structure, and I'm certainly for that, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also talking about self-transformation. Mm -hmm. Anon said that the revolution succeeds to the precise decree that each person takes it upon him or herself to liberate themselves in the mm -hmm. process and practice of struggle. Mm -hmm. We have to liberate ourselves in struggle, struggling mm -hmm. internally, but also struggling mm -hmm. together the society that has oppressed us and continues to oppress us. So that was a different dimension and people didn't like that. They would think, oh, let's just talk about social structure. No, we got to talk about you. You're lying, mm -hmm. not relating <laughs> right, you're not doing justice, you're not caring for people, what happened to them. You're talking about this abstract, the masses in the abstract. Mm -hmm. the masses are in front of us. Mm -hmm. They live with us. They don't always talk revolution. They ain't cuss. They drink mm -hmm. a lot, right? Mm -hmm. it, right? They might say anything, right? Mm -hmm. That comes to their mind because, hey, they are angry and they're mad about what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. They want you to hear that. I remember uh, my brother-in-law was like that. <clears throat> he asked me one time, he said, let me have some money, right? He, and he said, I said, oh, yeah, what you mean? He said, no, wait a minute, let me tell you why I need it. I said, no, you don't. He said, no, but I need to tell you. <laughs> he needed to tell a narrative. He needed to tell a story. It wasn't just about exchanging money. It was about how we relate to each other. Right, so I right. Stop. Listen, I can't do him any good if I don't do what he needs me to do. And he doesn't that's need just money. He needs, he to, needs to. That's right. That's why black people say, I hear you. That's I feel right. you. That's right. You see, Absolutely. That's so important. Yes. And we put a lot of emphasis on that as we struggle against the established order. Always two things at the same time. Mm. Ma Maulana, Maulana, if I may, uh, in, in terms of Kwanzaa, in terms of the philosophical grounding of Kwanzaa and the seven principles, I think this is probably uh, 
a good way to sort of segue into a conversation about Kwanzaa. How did that come about? I mean, it, is it stu- through the collective in the sense that you, you, you gathered people together? Because I know in 66, we always go back to 1966 when you had the first Kwanzaa, but, uh, but what's the philosophical grounding for this, those seven principles in Kwanzaa? Now, one of the things that's very important, and I don't want to seem immodest or anything, mm. but I don't want people to pretend somebody created Kwanzaa beside me, or 20 people got together and formulated. They don't do that with Ben or Clark or anybody they like. Rescue me if I'm wrong. They don't. They always want to deny the intellectual creativity of my line of career. Somebody else did it. Somebody else founded my organization. Somebody else created Kwanzaa. <laughs> Somebody help me get somebody. I, I'm help. sorry, I'm sorry, Marlana. You you're not by yourself on that. Now <laughs> you know how I you know I you know how to experience that with Afrocentricity. I'm not doing you know. I'm speaking to a kindred soul, and I defend that every time somebody brings it up. Yeah, that's right. yeah somebody might have said Afrocentricity or some way. But did they have a philosophy with it? That's right. Did they make it a fundamental discourse? <laughs> yeah. In the intellectual and social world that we live in and interact in. That's more left your scientist. You don't right. have to be able to say that. That's and right. give other people credit. But yeah. it's hard. In the quote I said, in the quote I said the same thing. <laughs> I'm always quoting white people. I'm gonna give them all kind of credit. That's right? Right. But they want to deny Africans That's their creative right. genius. That's, That's right. That's something. So anyhow, I'm I'm coming out of UCLA. I quit. I'm I should say I walked out. I'm always <laughs> intellectual, but I I want to get more involved in the movement. So I asked myself, what can I do? Following memory clavicles, understanding how do you use your knowledge, right? And so I decided I wanted to build an instrument of struggle. I wanted to build an institution that would ground black people in a certain way. I created Kwanzaa for three basic reasons. One, to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture, because as you've heard me say so many times, we were lifted out of our history and culture Mm -hmm. and made a footnote in forgotten casualty in Europe. Therefore, our struggle was essentially to return to our history and culture so we could speak our own special culture and make our own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed and also make our contribution to the forward flow of human history. Second, I created Kwanzaa to give us a time, African people, and all over the world, we could come together, sit down, reaffirm the bond between us, and meditate on the awesome meaning of being African in the world. And as you know, more than any other time during the year, Africans all over the world, on every continent in the world, throughout the world, African community turn inward when they celebrate Kwanzaa and ask about Africa. They try to speak some African words, reaffirm African values, tell African narratives and history, right? Where African folk, they try to recapture themselves and the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. Mm-hmm. And millions of people, I repeat, on every continent in the world. That's something. And black people, I give credit for that. Yes, I created it. My organization supported helped to spread it. All the, the nationalist groups are key to its spread mm-hmm. across the world. But it's the masses of our people that embraced it and made it a worldwide, global uh, holiday that it has become so important. And the third reason I created Quantum wants to, in fact, uh, introduce and reaffirm the importance of community and African values. Values that stress and strengthen family, community, and culture. And of course, the other end on which the holiday turns is the seven principles in Guzo Saba, Remote Unity, Kujichakliya, Self-Determination, Ujima, Collective Working Responsibility, Ujima, Objective economic, near purpose, um, creativity, and mind faith. Now, here's what I want to say. Kwanzaa, then, is first of all an act of freedom. 
It is an act of turning us to our culture in liberating ways, breaking the psychological chains of the oppressor, mm -hmm. right? Undermining and dismissing the catechism of impossibilities mm -hmm. that he has taught us and thinking about freedom, about being ourselves and freeing ourselves. Second, it's an act, it's an instrument of freedom. That is, it's a structure in which this kind of discourse and commitment to struggle to be ourselves and free ourselves is heightened and expanded. And finally, it's a celebration of struggle, a celebration of ourselves, a celebration of freedom. I'm sorry. So it's an act of freedom, it's an instrument of freedom, and it's a celebration of freedom because it's a celebration of the struggle for freedom. And it's a celebration of us having done just what I said, but from the catechism of impossibility, overcome the culture and imperialism of the dominant society, redefine in uh, our lives in our own image and nature. Because as I've said so many times, one of the greatest powers in the world is the power to define reality and make others accept it, even when it's to their disadvantage. And that's what you have continuously imposed on us, definitions that were clearly to our disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And we said no. Notice also how we did Kwanzaa. We didn't try to get no resolution passed by the city or the state <laughs> or the federal government. Right, that's that's right. an act of freedom. That's we right. celebrated. We called it for that's ourselves right. and we celebrated for ourselves. That's a very important point to remember. And so that's another reason why you look on the internet, white people and, <laughs> and their highlands yeah. and handmaidens are always trying to attack you, right? Because white people didn't create it. They didn't contribute to it. They yeah. didn't approve it. Yes. And sanction it. Yes. Right? If one of them had been uh, on it like they are with some of these organizations whose history they populate, they defend it. Have you write a dissertation on it? Have you prayed? Right. right? But otherwise, hey, you're on your own. So when you make a choice to be free, accept the responsibility of the pushback that we have. All right. Maulana, uh, one, one uh, uh, last question. Uh, could you somehow just speak on the Black Life Matter movement, uh, the 60s and the 50s, the civil rights movement? You don't have to talk, you, you, you know, you don't, I, I just want you to uh, sort of say where we are in the movement uh, when you see the Black Lives Matter movement, um, as, uh, how does it relate to the 60s and even to the civil rights movement? And if there's anything else you want to add, by all means, please feel free to add. Okay, Bob. All resistance, all resistance is a continuation of our first resistance. Every revolt that we sure. had, every movement that we have is attributed to our resistance to the Holocaust of enslavement, which is our initial, our initial encounter with the cavemen, right? Mm -hmm. With our mm -hmm. cave oppressors. Whether we call it imperialism, colonialism, or the Holocaust of enslavement, it is white supremacy. It is white domination mm -hmm. with various masks. Mm -hmm. And we have been struggling against this since we encountered them. So nothing comes into being by itself. Everything is a result of that which came before it. And that is why we right. say, if you know the beginning well, the end won't trouble you. Mm -hmm. and that's why Malcolm said, of all our studies, history is best prepared to reward our own research best qualified to reward all research. Mm -hmm. So we know history and we, we look at it and we ask ourselves, how does this come into being? The modern Black Lives Movement begins, as you know, with the murder of Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. But it does not take off until Ferguson. Ferguson becomes the revolutionary spark that ignites a forest fire of resistance all over the country. And it led to the struggle against police violence that took us to and past George Floyd and Breonna Taylor to the latest victims that you know that happened on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. These three women decided to you know, respond to this and they 
coined the phrase Black Lives Matter. And it was a good phrasing. You know why? Because people could embrace it without feeling they're threatening themselves. Mm. You say black power. That's all you got to explain that. You know what I mean? You got to explain that. That's, that's like the difference between wearing locks and the natural, right? That's right. You don't have to explain the locks, but you don't have to explain that natural. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you're becoming a fad again, right? But before, you know, you couldn't get a job with a natural, right? And so I mm -hmm. think it's very important. For a while, they were mad with the locks, too, but mm -hmm. not as much because it represents. And that's why. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get this. Okay. So, <laughs> so Black Lives Matter becomes like an easy thing and an easy way for white people to agree without doing anything. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is agree, right? Yeah, now, Black that Lives doesn't Matter. mean that the Black Lives Matter movement accepts that because they have been very successful and they've been the vanguard in the struggle against police violence. And I applaud them for that, right? Mm -hmm. But I always said to them, and we have um, a, a good sister uh, in our group, the Black Community Clergy and Labor Alliance, a major leader in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Dr. Uh, Melina Abdullah. Uh, and she's she's a good thinking, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, she's like committed, I mean, you know, so I have great That's respect right. for her. I appreciate That's her. Right. Uh, and she was the first one to come when we were struggling uh, to. Uh, uh, Number one, keep our own, keep our department from being downside, and also to win the AB 1460, which actually uh, legally demands and requires that anybody graduating in California in a CSU system, Cal State University, has to take that new step. And we give Dr. Shirley Webber credit for that. It's uh, a wonderful shout out. Him, but I really want you to do it. So here's Black Lives Matter. It's very important at this historical moment to continue that. And when people stand up and talk about uh, they like Clyburn, and I, I shouldn't mention the name. I don't like to do it because then you get talking about a person. It's the ideas I'm criticizing. Okay, keep in mind that. When anybody, Biden did this too. Obama did this too. Saying that the Black Lives Matter saying defund the police mm -hmm. cost them votes. No, no, it didn't cost them. What they're doing is borrowing, first of all, this is wrong because it's borrowing pathological language, always indicting the black people. When the, when the Latinos don't vote for them, they say, we need better outreach. When 25% of the Jews don't vote for them, they don't say nothing at all, right? When all the other people don't vote for them, if it don't be for us, they won't even be in the office. That's right. They should defer to us. That's what they should do. But you know, what they're doing is use that pathology. The next thing they're doing is avoiding the responsibility of their failure to outreach. When, mm. the, when the Latinos didn't vote for them in Arizona and Texas, etc., they said, we need, see, y'all should have done more. We need to put more money. We need to, but they take us for granted. And they're looking for a scapegoat instead of that. That's immoral and irresponsible. And they're going to lose again if they don't reach out and cultivate in black people a respect for them. Black people don't respect what they say and what they do. Mm -hmm. And yet they still vote for what they think are the most progressive initiatives. But all of them don't do that. If That's you want right. more of them to do that, it's mm -hmm. your responsibility to get them out. Don't mm -hmm. be talking about they haven't come out. Mm -hmm. Why haven't they come out? Mm -hmm. They come out when they think it's something important to come out with. Those people that thought it was important, they came out. Those that didn't, didn't. So what we need to do is get them. So I challenge people to stop criticizing Black Lives Matter and begin to support their initiative. What do they mean by defunding? They look at a situation where the police are over aggressive and deadly, showing a, what do you call this, a radical and uh, ruthless disregard for uh, black lives and black uh, rights. They're over aggressive, right? Second, they are overfunded. They are unaccountable. Mm -hmm. And they are misassigned to tasks they're not prepared for, like dealing with somebody that has some mental problems. 
or solving the domestic uh, 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 conflict. Mm -hmm. Right? They're not required. They shouldn't be into that. So what Black Lives Matter is saying, use that for social Sunday. Redirect that money where it can be most useful and not overfund the police and let them pursue military solutions to social problems. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. In fact, the government sent them military money. And when they go to Rome, they talk in military talk. And when they stop and talk to you, they talk to you like they're occupying army, like they're in Iraq or somewhere, right? And they shouldn't be doing that to Iraq. By the way, I think they wrong there. By the way, they're wrong about Palestine. <laughs> they're wrong about Yemen, right? They're wrong about mm -hmm. Iraq. They're wrong mm -hmm. about Syria. I, I can't even think mm -hmm. why they're right. Mm -hmm. They're not right here. Yes. By the way. <laughs> All right, Asante Sana Maulana, Maulana. Our ancestors say uh, that when they open their mouth, uh, they let the gods speak. And uh, in uh, your uh, discussion and uh, preview of your forthcoming book uh, on Malcolm and your words to, to, to tonight, uh, you, you have elevated us. For 400 years, uh, we have traveled the long back of the, uh, of the snake, uh, uh, but with hope uh, because of people like yourselves uh, whose collective memory never forgets the masses. Uh, we, we, are, we, we are, because of you, green shoots on the olive tree uh, of history. And through the gloom of the storm, you have made light for us today. Uh, you, you, you are like a swallow spinning at dawn while others are fast asleep. You have made yourself what you have imagined, and you have also helped us very much give us what we need. If I were uh, capable, I would give you a, a huge isibongi because you have certainly earned it by your work and by your life. Uh, we, 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 I would like to just say we have 140 people. Uh, we have people from Brazil. We have people from Paris. Uh, we have, I think, people from Ethiopia. Uh, and we have people from South Africa. And I want to say uh, to uh, some of those like Raylan Rabaka, it's I'm happy to see him online. I'm so happy to see Valerie Harrison. Her new book, uh, Do Right By Me, is going to be a bestseller. It's an incredible book, Valerie Harrison's book, Do Right By Me, look it up. Uh, I'm so happy to see Kemet uh, Swahili from Brazil, from uh, uh, Salvador and Brother Mutu from Paris. These are just few people. Brother Chike, uh, uh, Sister, uh, all, uh, we got all, we got we got a whole lot of people here, and all of the people who have come to support Malana uh, from the NACO organization. We have some of the uh, outstanding ones. I see their names even. Uh, we have had uh, uh, Dr. Shabaka to yeah. speak for us before, Dr. Shegun. So we're happy to see him. And, uh, and so many, many, many. Uh, Sister Ife Shanga, we haven't seen her for a while. Brother Carlton and Brother Joe Foster, all these great people. Maulana, you have done us a great service. May the ancestors always bless you and may your life be long. And may we always win uh, the victories for our people. Uh, Asante Sana. And thank you very much. Thank you to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to say a, a couple of closing words. We're not going to have a question and answer, right? No, sir. Okay. So I would like to just say that uh, I didn't finish saying about uh, Egypt. You had asked me about Egypt, and I need to, because that is my fundamental source of reference. Uh, for um, the work I do now, even though I also do if I or do if I work and your work, I want to say that I accept uh, the argument that <clears throat> we must return to the study of Egypt for three reasons it, and embrace it as our own. It will reconcile African history with human history. 
Give us the basis of building a new body of human science with new paradigm and renew after certain lay the basis of uh, renewing African culture. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Molefe and Sanjay, for this invitation, this exchange. And I want to tell people that I, I, I really want you to donate to the Molefe Ketcha Sanjay Institute. Uh, it's important. This is an important, this is a unique black think tank, or I should say African think tank. Uh, I say black. <laughs> black is colloquial. African is not. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm into black. You know? <laughs> I know. So, so I really want you to yeah. see the uniqueness of the work that Dr. Asante does. He's a pathfinder. He's a way opener. And he has a depth for grasp of what is to be done is in the process of doing it. So thank you for that. I close, as I always close my uh, lecture. This is our duty to know our past and honor, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future, and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. And this too, brothers and sisters, continue the struggle, keep the faith, hold the line, love and respect each other, our people and each other, seek and speak truth, do and demand justice, be constantly concerned with the well-being of the world and all in it, and dare help rebuild the overarching movement that prefigures and makes possible the good world we all want and deserve to live in and leave as a legacy worthy of the name and history of Africa. Ocha, Ashe. Bayete, Mala! Bayete. Thank you. <laughs>